I would like to welcome you today to our worship service, the service of St. Mark's Coptic Orthodox Church here in Toronto. We start with one priest in all of North America, and I was traveling from east to west, from north to south. Father Marcos Marcos, a life of dedication and giving for the glory of God. Chapter 1, Beginnings, Early Life to Priesthood Father Marcos was born Wegdi Elias Abdin Masih Marcos on August 21, 1929 in the city of Sohag in Upper Egypt. After finishing his secondary education in Sohaj, Wegdi went to study engineering at Cairo University. Halfway through the program, however, he felt an inward call to serve the Lord and was compelled to seek the spiritual over the worldly. So he discontinued his engineering studies and switched to a full-time study program at the Coptic Theological Seminary in Cairo. In 1957, he graduated with a Bachelor of Theology from the Coptic Orthodox Theological Seminary. He later furthered his knowledge at the Hartford Theological Seminary in Connecticut where he obtained his bachelor degree in 1960. However, his quest for knowledge was far from complete. In 1961, he completed his thesis and obtained his master's degree from the Hartford School of Religious Education in Connecticut. He was then enlisted as a postgraduate student between 1961 to 1962 at the Iliff School of Theology in Denver, Colorado. In 1963, returning from his North American trip, Bishop Samuel got the blessing of Pope Corollus VI to ask Wegdi Elias if he would accept to be the priest who would serve the Copts in North America. Even with his qualifications, Wegdi was humbled by the request feeling inadequate for the call to holy orders, so he politely declined the offer. Later, however, with prayers and encouragement from others, including Bishop Shenouda, later Pope Shenouda III, he accepted. He was told by Pope Corollus VI to ready himself for the ordination, meaning to get married as soon as possible. So he proposed to and married Miss Suzanne Yacoub, who became a true helpmate throughout his ministry.
August 9, 1964, Pope Carolus VI delegated Bishop Athanasius of Beni Suev to conduct the ordination of Wegdi Ilyas in the old cathedral of St. Mark in Cairo. Uh, 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 uh. Listening to Bishop Athanasius' solemn cry, We call you Marcos, priest for God's altar of the Coptic Orthodox Church of North America. He could not hold the tears running down his face. <laughs> ندعوك يا مرقص قصا على مذبح الكنيسة القبطية الأرثوكسية بأمريكا الشمالية كان بيقولها بحس عالي أنا جسمي كله كان بيترعش Seven years later, in August 1971, Father Marcos would be elevated to archpriest by then visiting Metropolitan Antonios, who was the acting pope following the repose of Pope Carolus VI in March 1971. My first knowledge of Abuna Moros was through my uncle, Abuna Salib Suriel, who was the priest of Giza. And uh, he was working with Lamba Samuel and Lamba Shnuda, talking to Sayyidina Lamba Korolos uh, about sending a priest to North America. So they picked uh, Abuna Moros to be the one that would uh, uh, would be the priest that they picked. And since he was not married, Abuna Salib found Madame Susie, and he is the one that actually conducted the marriage uh, ceremony for Abuna Moros. Years later, he paid me back by conducting my marriage ceremony with Helen. My uncle got him stuck, and he in turn got me stuck as well. 41 years ago, when I first came to Canada, I was introduced to Father Marcus by a friend of mine who had come to Canada before me, just a few months before me. And um, my friend volunteered to tell Father Marcus that my father is a priest too. And then Father Marcus asked, uh, who is your father? And I said, uh, Abuna Samani Sheikh. And said, what's your full name then? I said, my full name is Amun Ayad Ayub. And they, he told my friend, don't worry about him. I know this person before he was born because I, I had known his father. When his, his father was a layman and he used to come to my hometown in Sohag and preach there. So that was my first encounter just to learn that Father Marcus had known me before my birth. It was really funny and very nice and a very nice introduction into the church with his fatherly attitude he actually accommodated me and he made me feel comfortable from the first minute I saw him. In the fall of 1968, it was probably November 1968. For the two years before that, I was working in Africa, in East Africa, in Tanzania, as a doctor. And there were no Coptic churches in Tanzania at that time. I could not have communion, did not have any confession sessions. And when I came to Canada, the first thing I wanted to do is to confess. And that's when I met Abu Namoros. It was uh, an enlightening experience. Father Marcus 
really taught me how to confess. He listened to me and then he started asking me questions about my spiritual life, my prayers, reading the, the Bible. He was the first real father in confession that I had. Chapter 2, Serving the Cops in North America In North America, Father Marcos began his ministry with great diligence and dedication. First, his focus was the three major metropolitan centers in the East, New York, Toronto, and Montreal. As more Coptic communities began to form in the West and in smaller cities, Father Marcos's travel schedule became very hectic, earning him the nickname the Flying Priest. This pace of service continued until the arrival from Egypt in 1967 of Father Raphael Nechla, who had studied in France, to serve in Montreal. The two priests then divided the responsibilities of serving the continent between them to East and West. The choice of Toronto was motivated by the special attachment the Toronto community had shown to Father Marcos. It also helped that early on, when Father Marcos applied for residence in North America, the U.S. had offered him a visitor visa only, while Canada granted him immigrant status up front. He went to the Vatican and uh, I couldn't get a, a visa myself to go with him. And uh, what happened he, when he was there, he did a paper and he put it on the cardinals uh, uh, in there in the Vatican. And this was supposed to be no, no. So uh, because he printed the church stand about the Jews, he said the Jews, they are responsible for Jesus' blood and stuff like that. So they called him and he said, why did you do that? And uh, he said, I didn't know that this is forbidden, you know. So what happened is the, this came in the newspaper that the, the priest of the Coptic Church is doing disturbance in the Vatican. The ambassador, he read it in the newspaper. So he called him and said, what can I do for you? You enter Rafa'at Ras Masr, So what, what can we do for you? So he said, uh, get my wife from Egypt. He said, why? He said, she cannot get an exit visa. So he said, no, no, no. My, my wife is coming next week and your wife will be with her. So this is what happened. This is how I got an exit visa to come out of Egypt uh, to, to meet him in the Vatican. He had to face a big challenge in the beginning of his ministry in North America. And that is the ministry itself. How to organize services in all the communities, the Coptic communities that spread out in the States and in Canada. That wasn't an easy task to, uh, to, to undertake. But he was always depending on God counting on God, and uh, he was, as I said, a man of great faith. I found out that time that Father Marcus had arrived in North America here uh, in November 1964. Yeah. And six months later, I came here, end of April 1965. At that time, one of the big challenges for Father Marcus was to find a place to live, to find a church to worship, and there was no place to live, no church to, to worship, no uh, financial resources. He was met actually with a, by a group. They were coming to North America. They were not interested at all in the church or really serious about it. By God's grace and by Father Marcus' strong faith and uh, prayer without ceasing, he managed to overcome all these obstacles. So Krolos is the one who ordained him, right, as a priest. And he loved him very much. And uh, Pope Krolos asked him to stay with him, uh, to do the Mass with him every morning. So he used to wake up at 5 o'clock and do the Mass with Pope Krolos. Uh, at the time, Pope Shenouda was the... the Uskhof uh, al so, uh, you know, uh, he was close to him too, and, uh, and then Pope Tawadros, like, uh, 
like he he passed by the three popes, you know. So, uh, but uh, Pope Carolus was so close to him, like he loved Pope Carolus, and he loved to have a mass with him every morning. When uh, Pope Carolus ordained him, uh, he told him uh, an advice: don't make your peace in the mouth of people. And he said, do you know what I mean by that? Like, if they say bad words about you, don't be upset. If they said good words, okay, uh, it's all right, but this is not, you know, that you, you, you wanted to hear. So it, it was really tough in the beginning, you know. And uh, what happened is, like, when we first came, okay, the church here, they didn't have any money or anything, so they can pay his salary. So what happened is like uh, we rented uh, an apartment and uh, we, it was two bedroom apartment. We lived in, in one room and the other one was a guest room and in the meantime an office and stuff like that. So the church used the other room. When our house was open all the time and uh, we used to uh, like if somebody uh, came and they don't have a place they stayed with us and I had to do, you know, everything, you know, look after the guests, look after the house and stuff like that. I had to, to go to work because, you know, to support uh, the, the family. So I started working and I was working for about maybe 45 years to support the church and support, you know, the, the, the family and stuff like that. So it was tough in the beginning. The beginning was very tough, you know. And, it's just the beginning, you know, and, and, but the people were nice and, you know, the people were friendly and, uh, you know, uh, Abuna was serving them with all what he could. Chapter 3 Serving in Toronto Early Days Early on in Toronto, the Divine Liturgy service was conducted in various rented locations. But thanks to the good relations Father Marcos established with other Canadian churches, the Anglican Church in 1965 offered the use of their Holy Trinity Church Chapel free of charge to the Coptic community to use for their Sunday service. And in 1968, they gave full use of their St. Matthias Church, also free of charge. In 1970, the United Church offered their church compound on Caledonia Road for $1 per year lease. This building was sold in 1977 and the Coptic community had to worship in a rented school auditorium. So many of the youth in the, who were young, very young youth in the 1980s mentioned that if they wanted to have confession, Abuna used to tell them, come hop in my car. I'm going to do, uh, going to this place, so while we are going, we can have confession and we come back. So he used every second of his time to serve the Lord. I met Father uh, Marcos following a, a liturgy service on a Sunday in February 1969. At that time, the church service was carried at the Church of the Holy Trinity. I received a warm welcome from Father Marcos together with an encouraging support for the new phase of my life in Canada. My first impressions were he's a good listener, patient, and caring understanding. And Abuna Moro start everything from scratch. Anything he, he did, there was no something before him. There was no something done here before. He did this was very, uh, very humble way, very nice way, always calm, never lost his peace, never shout, never overshowed his managerial skill. He always had the skill, but he had it in a very humble way that you don't convince people or you say you do this and you do that. He, he did it with love. Uh, everything was to convince you you can do that for your church. You have to love what you do first. You have to, you got convinced that this is for a greater, uh, better of the whole Christian community in, in here. And, and I think that's why God bless him with all this success afterwards. Uh, 
because he just seeded, he took the what God gave him as a talent and he invested very well with, with people and uh, in a very simple, humble way. The biggest challenge that Father Marx faced when he first came to North America is to introduce the Coptic Church to the people here. Nobody knew anything about the Coptic Church. We had no previous existence in the whole continent here. Father Marcos was very instrumental in establishing connections with different denominations, with politicians, to tell them about the greatness of our Coptic heritage and our Coptic history and our great church. And he started to come to the church to see what kind of church it was. Father Marcus was the first one ever to have connection with the uh, local TV stations here at the time, religious programs, and he convinced them to come and record the Coptic liturgy from beginning to end. And he gave the sermon on that day and people started to know about the Coptic Church. That was a very beautiful introduction to the Coptic Church, to the city of Toronto here and the Canadian community. I came to Canada 1967, I was going to uh, University of Toronto and living in Trinity College. I wa one day I walked downtown to Eaton Center and behind Eaton Center there is a church, I believe it's Holy Trinity. I walked in there and that's when I first met Father Marcus. We were actually involved with the Roman Catholic Church at that time. Camille started going to the Coptic Church in Toronto at St. Mark's at that time, and that would have been around in the 1980s. And he was going by himself, and I would notice on the Sunday he would come back home, he would be so happy, and it made me very curious. And so um, we started to go together with our two children. And initially all we did, we sat upstairs in the balcony of St. Mark's Church and uh, following the service and Camille would be explaining things to me. And then when the sermon was on and the children were in Sunday school, Camille would be translating the Arabic into English, so I would be getting the message. So that was my first kind of uh, exposure to the Coptic Church, and then that's when I would be meeting Father Marcus, of course, after the service, who met me very warmly, made me feel very welcome, very comfortable. And then later on, Father Marcus thought it would be a very good idea if we become a member of the Canadian Council of Churches. And he applied for the membership there and were accepted. Actually, the Coptic delegate at the Canadian Council of Churches became the vice principal of the entire council in one of the uh, terms of the, that repeats itself every three years of the Canadian Council of Churches. And people started to know about the Coptic Church, to exchange views with us, and to know our history. And the, when I was first ordained, Father Marx told me specifically, I would like you to be the ecumenical officer of the Coptic Church and to represent us in the Canadian Council of Churches. I've been doing this for almost the last 28 years representing my great Coptic Church in Canadian Council of Churches. And now, everyone from coast to coast knows about the Coptic Church. We have many parishes. We have many priests, people who even speak English far better than myself. And we have become successful introducing our great church to almost everyone in Canada. Once after he finished the liturgy and was preparing to give communion, when he noticed in the lineup for communion, a Catholic priest standing there. The Catholic priest whispered in his ears, please, Father, give me communion. So Father Marcos asked him, are you spiritually and physically prepared for communion? And the Catholic priest said, yes. Father Marcos, guided by the grace of God, decided to give him communion. 
So he gave him communion. After the service was over, the priest came to explain to him what happened. And he was accompanied by a young lady whom Father Marcos had baptized and accepted into the Coptic Church a few months before and did her wedding. The priest told him that the woman, after being baptized and after being married in the church, was attacked by thoughts of guilt that she left the Catholic Church and now joined the Coptic Church. So she came back to her old Catholic father in confession and told him about these guilt feelings that she had. So the priest told her, okay, next week I will come to the Coptic Church with you and I will take communion there so that you know and you'll be assured that there is no guilt in taking communion in the Coptic Church. Father Marcus realized that it was the grace of God that led him to this decision because had he refused to give him communion, everything would have went wrong. I don't know if I were in his steps or in his footsteps if I would have had the courage and the wisdom to do what Father Marcus did. Chapter 4 Planning to build a Coptic church, miraculous acquisition of the land. The Coptic community was expanding rapidly due to the arrival of new immigrants. There was an urgent need to have a permanent building for a church. Father Marcos, along with the congregation, agreed to look for a church to buy, or better yet, to purchase a land and build a traditional Coptic church. Either of these options were quite bold at the time. The prospect of finding something reasonable within the community's financial resources looked dismal. But miracles could happen. Indeed, an acre of land was offered to Father Marcos for one dollar by builder William McClintock. It was an unbelievable offer. The size and location of the land were just right. It truly was a gift from God. So the first challenge was to actually establish, um, in my mind, establish the, the, the church and have a building for it. And God really helped them by getting uh, uh, McClintock to offer the, this piece of land for one dollar, which helped uh, propel the, uh, the building of this church. He had a lot of uh, arguments around the size of this church. Like they, they wanted to build it with 200, uh, 250 attendees. He insisted on building it with 500 attendees. Chapter 5 The First Visit of His Holiness Pope Shenouda III to Toronto Breaking the Ground for the Church Building The groundbreaking ceremony for the church building was timed to coincide with His Holiness Pope Shenouda III's visit to Toronto in April 1977, which was also his first visit to North America. The Pope met with the Coptic congregation at St. James Cathedral, conducted the Divine Liturgy at St. Anne Church, and officiated in the ceremony of breaking the ground and consecrating and laying of the cornerstone for the church building.
Chapter 6 Building the First Coptic Style Church in North America. Two years after the acquisition of the land, and less than one year after breaking the ground, a church that was built, according to the Coptic style, which accommodates 450 worshippers, was finally built and ready for the celebration of the Paschal week in April 1978. This was another miracle by any standard. For when the land was acquired, for the price of one dollar, the community had saved only fifty thousand dollars over several years prior. However, the cost of the building was estimated at six hundred thousand dollars. The church would have to pay half this amount to qualify for a bank loan to cover the considerable sum of the remaining balance. Some people felt that this was not a viable undertaking and recommended reducing the building by half. They were proven wrong. God moved the hearts of many and donations came from all over. That not only covered half of the construction cost, but also helped repay the bank loan in less than three years. Finally, St. Mark had a church built in his name in Scarborough, Ontario, Canada, the first in North America to be built in the Coptic style. The church was consecrated in September 1978 by Bishop Rewais in a ceremony attended by 17 priests from all over North America. During the early years of the church, services were conducted in different churches and schools. By the early 70s, there was a defined need to have a church of our own. At that time, there, was, there were two competing voices, one that supported the church and the other voice which had a short-sighted view. There was no need for the building of our own. Their thinking was most of the congregation will integrate in Canadian society with no affiliation to the Coptic Church. The wisdom of Father Marcus and his calm nature was answered by God for providing the land which the Mother Church was built on it. At that time, we were about 32 families with uh, half of us was mixed marriages from German and Austrian and Polish, Polish and uh, uh, also. But they were really nice people. And I remember then, Father Marcus used to say, kids, just work hard, save all your pennies because I'm going to build a church. I said, Abuna, what, what are you talking about? <laughs> well, about? What are you talking about, a church? But the church, we can't even find uh, jobs yet here, you know. So anyway, he said, no, no, we will, we will. And this is sure enough, then we can tell him about, about uh, when you used to do uh, the kitchen yeah, was, we uh, used to do the was, kitchen with Susie. With Susie, we get the kitchen. We made twenty dollars oh. on a Sunday, for, and that was a big thing for us. We went. Uh, we was here somewhere up. Yeah. Chapter seven: The first fruits of Saint Mark Church. The opening of the newly finished church building gave a tremendous boost to what the church could offer to her congregation. Regular activities now included liturgical services, Bible study meetings, Sunday school, servants meetings, publications, and many more. These together with regular outreach by bishops of the Mother Church, particularly His Grace Bishop Ruiz, and the nurturance and encouragement of Father Marcos enabled the budding church to bear fruits in due season. Among this was the ordination of several of her deacons and servants to the priesthood to serve in newly found churches in other jurisdictions, as well as at St. Mark to help Father Marcos with the expanding ministry. 
These ordinations began with Father Athanasius Iskander for the new church in Mississauga, Father John Ramsey for the new church in Pompano Beach, Florida, Father Wes Howard for the new church in North York, and Father Ammonios Gerges at St. Mark Church in Scarborough. موضوع الاختيار للكهنوت ده وكده يعني كان شوية صعب علينا لكن الواحد كان يلمس أبوة كبيرة جدا من قدس أبونا مرقص لأنه هو بيحتوي الأنسان كده بمحبة يعني أنا فاكر مرة من المواقف اللي هي حصلت تورينا يعني قدر إيه كان أبونا مرقص يعني يحب إن هو يشجع الناس ومرة كنا بنصلي قداس في الكنيسة في سانت هيرست اللي هي يعني في العمارات بتاعت سانت هيرست وكان جوتس أبونا مرقص هو اللي عليه القداس يوم السبت كان بتصلى القداس في سانت هيرست واحد من الخدام راح يعني حط الدرس بتاع مدرس الأحد عشان كان بعد القداس في خدمة مدرس الأحد فراح حد من خدام حط الدرس بتاع اللي كتبه يعني بتاع مدرس الأحد حطه على المسبح عشان يعني ربنا يدي بركة في الكلمة فراح أبونا شاف الورقة دي فراح أبونا خد الورقة دي وبعد ما خلص القداس كانت العزة تبقى في آخر القداس فراح أبونا قعد يبوله ترابيزة وكرسي وأحد وراح أبونا أرى الدرس قال لهم بصوا أنا مش هقول لكم عزة النهاردة أنا حقر عليكم الدرس ده لقيته متحضر وجميل فأنا حقر عليكم فأبونا راح أرى الدرس بتاع الخادم ده وساب العزة بتاعته وقالها للناس يعني فدي من المواقف يعني الجميلة اللي الواحد إيه يعني نحس كده بروح التشجيع لأبونا مرقص وهو بيشجع الناس الصغيرين وكده يعني Before becoming a priest where uh, some people came and said uh, you know uh, be careful Abuna uh, 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 like you're coming in like a youngest priest and Abuna Moros does you know does not allow any other voices around or and uh, <laughs> Uh, and of course, I discovered uh, soon enough that that's not true. Uh, Abuna listens to everyone. Abuna actually listens to the youngest first, <laughs> to my surprise, and I was always put on the spot. Uh, he asks, uh, yeah, for my um, weakness to uh, to give an opinion. He's always open to listen, but also he's firm, like because he listened to everyone, he makes um, a final decision. I was actually very much surprised to find Father Marcus welcoming me in Pearson Airport when I first came to Toronto as a priest serving in the area of the GTA. This for me was a very big honor. And for me, it was the first encounter with Father Marcus in a personal level, and I knew straight away how loving to his children was Father Marcus, how accommodating was he to all of them, and how receptive he was to all of them, uh, so that they can feel the warmth of fatherly love, and they can feel the presence of a role model for them. The fathers uh, here in uh, St. Mark invited me to come uh, during uh, Lent time uh, to have like a revival uh, in the church. Fatabana, I was expecting myself, I have my parents uh, live in uh, Mississauga. So I was planning to go and stay in Mississauga and whenever there is a talk, I will come to uh, the church and then come back to my family. But Abuna Moros uh, said, no, uh, Abuna is our guest and he has to stay with us uh, in my home and he has to stay in my home. Uh, and actually, he was so hospitable and yani, he was so welcoming in uh, how he received me. One of the funny things that uh, during these days, uh, one came and was talking to me, so Abuna stood and told him, no, when you address Abuna, you tell him, Utsak. And he insisted so much to uh, respect priesthood, and he respected priesthood so much. When Father Marcus started a new youth group in the old church, I would say this was about uh, 35 years ago. 
He brought a, a large group at that time. It was uh, large enough, a large group of uh, youth in the basement of the church. Father Mark started that meeting by saying, we have three new counselors that I would like to introduce to you. They would be your coun counselors here in the youth group. Said the first one is uh, Skander Bolis. He's an engineer and he is the son of a priest in Egypt. And he introduced Skander to everyone. And then he said, I, we have also Amun Gerges. He's an engineer and he's a son of a priest. And he introduced my weakness. And then he said, we have a third person. We have Shireen Ramsey. And the rest of the youth said, and a son of a priest. He said, no, this time you're not right. Through the grace of God, Shireen Ramsey, yes, he was an engineer, but later on he became a priest himself. So Father Marx used to do things in a, in a very casual way, but it, it was fulfilling the will of God. He was creating leaders for the church. I never imagined to be a priest myself. I don't think that Shireen Ramsey at that time imagined himself to be a priest. But we are still disciples of Father Marcus. We'd like to carry on his legendary goals for the church. And we are so proud to be his disciples forever. One day I, uh, we had a small youth group for grade seven and eight. And we had the challenge that the youth meeting starts from five to six. And then we have a one hour game, game time from six to seven. So all the youth start coming to the meeting at six for the game. So Abuna told me, okay, we start the meeting with the game time from five to six. And the lesson start at six, six to seven. So we did. So the youth came at, at, at five, enjoying big game. The number reached at the time up to 60 youth. And then we started the lesson with all of them. Some of them stayed after that for, for the Vespers. So he had a solution to any issue we encounter. Always think, thinking about an alternative serving the church. Yeah. Father Marcus, despite all his busy and uh, unbelievable traveling from here to there to all North America, so he decided to come and visit me in our new apartment at that time. When he came, he saw Magdi, my son, he was about 14, 15 years old at that time. He said, Alfie, how come Magdi doesn't come to the youth group meeting? I said, Abuna, <laughs> Abu, Abuna what, what youth group meeting? I never heard about it. He said, oh yeah, we just started one now. It's very, very good nucleus and it's gonna grow. And so I said, okay, I come from and we try. So I took my son Magdi and went there and said, Magdi, let's give it a try and see what you think. He was very happy there, Magdi, and made some group, some, some good friends. The first uh, youth group of St. Mark. What a blessed nucleus group was. Uh, there was Fred, Fred Azuz and his brothers, Tom Azuz. And there was Helen Boktor. Salwa Azer, which now is Dr. Salwa Azer, the Salama boys, the three Salama boys, Ahmad Salama, Adil Salama, and Atif Salama. Now, Ahmad Salama, one of this youth group, became later on Bishop David in America. Adil Salama became Father Bishoy Salama, who serves now in this church of uh, uh, St. Maurice and St. Verena. And then we have also Han Ishaq, whose father is Dr. Faig Ishaq, who wrote the Coptologia books. And then Magdi Abdel Messih, who's my son, and he still till now serves in different capacities in the youth group. Now, the two counselors at that time who were counseling this group was El Bash Mohandis or engineer Johanna Ramsey, who later became Abuna, Abuna John Ramsey. And then Abu El, El Bashmohandis engineer Amun Girgis, who became later our beloved father, Amun Girgis, who works very tirelessly in the church. What a blessed group. What a, <laughs> what a fruit of Father Marcus's services. What a blessing 
Fara Marcus brought to this continent. Chapter 8 Building an Extension to St. Mark's. Barely a decade passed since building the Church of St. Mark, and its facilities started to feel limited and inadequate to meet the demands of the ever growing congregation, even with the founding of new Coptic churches in the surrounding area. The architectural design of the church building had provisions for a future extension to be built if the need arose and if the financial resources permitted. There was no alternative but to go ahead with the expansion. The project would cost more than three times the cost of the existing building, partly because of the need to build underground parking to double the existing number of parking spots. But this was not the main obstacle for the church had to secure the approval of all the neighbors which was not forthcoming. Thanks to God in miraculous ways, the city stood with the church and gave the church the green light to go ahead with the project. Again encouraged by their experience that God's help always comes, especially in difficult situations, the congregation gave freely and the project was paid for shortly after its completion in 1992. Father Marcus was a man of faith. At the time we were about to build the new addition to the old church, what we call now the culture center, the museum, and the Sunday school classes, and the underground garage. Uh, that was a huge endeavor again. And um, we had to borrow a large amount of money from the bank. And people were worried about this, and I remember some of the old members who actually established the church in the beginning came to me, I was a priest at that time, and said, this loan is going to be paid off. Maybe 25 years later, the, the children of our children will do that. Father Marx told me, don't worry, everything will be fine. And we were all a little bit uh, leery about that huge loan. It suffices me to say here that through his prayers and great faith, the loan was completely paid off in less than five years. Chapter 9, The Coptic Museum, the first in North America. The new extension provided a variety of rooms, among which is a dedicated space for the Coptic Museum. The vision of a Coptic Museum began with Father Marcos, who shortly after his ordination asked and got the blessing of His Holiness Pope Carolus VI to establish a Coptic museum to introduce the rich cultural and spiritual heritage of the Copts to their descendants as well as to the North American people at large. While he was serving the Coptic communities in North America, he was able to collect a significant number of artifacts donated by various Copts which formed the nucleus of the museum's collection. Some of the donated items are six precious paintings by the late renowned Coptic artist Margaret Nechla. The Coptic Museum was inaugurated on November 27, 1996 by His Holiness Pope Shenouda III during his third visit to Toronto. When I came back from uh, Geneva, Switzerland in 2000 and uh, the thought came to me that I could see what I could do uh, in St. Mark's Church uh, and I asked a friend of mine if she could introduce me to Father Marcos and she uh, warned me that I better be prepared that he would ask me how I could serve the church. Uh, when he heard that I was returning and not uh, looking for full-time employment he said well now how can you serve the church? Well I was prepared for that I, I knew that there was a museum and uh, I had a love for culture and identity so I suggested maybe I could do something in the museum and his face lit up in this magnificent smile that he had uh, that I was to learn later uh, that it was because I had somehow touched something important for him. A lot of people don't know what Father Marcus had has been preparing over the years to build that museum. Being a leader with a vision, he knew exactly what he was after. 
I remember one day he told us that he was going to make a trip, a short trip to Florida. And he went there for only one day or two and came back because at that time he was the only priest in the church. And he went there because he heard of a piece of art that was drawn by Pope Macarius. This is the uh, 114th Pope of Alexandria. And um, he was known for his type of art of uh, drawing crosses in uh, such a beautiful uh, woven lines together. And this was a, a very rare piece of art. And he went to Florida because he knew the owner. He went there and he convinced the owner to donate, donate it to the museum. And he brought it with him. And now this is one of the most beautiful piece of art that we have in the center of the Coptic Museum. Uh, as we see it today uh, when you enter from uh, the central door of the museum. To me throughout this whole period of knowing him from working with him so closely for almost 18 years, uh, he, he never saw it as different from his pastoral or priestly ministry. The ministry of our heritage was very integral to, to who he was and to his ministry and vice versa. And it was very interesting that uh, while I was going through all the papers uh, of our past and organized them, I recently found this uh, in one of his files, which was the agenda of one of our meetings um, in 2006. And at the back he wrote this, I feel that upholding our heritage is a ministry that we all should share in the glory of God. Uh, it has some scratched out notes uh, uh, of words there. I don't know what made him write that, I can't remember that, but I think it, it, it really brings the essence of what he saw this ministry uh, of the, the museum. He was able to document the source of each artifact and to ensure that we have documents to support our ownership of it. It's a great task, but this was done all behind the scene. No one could appreciate what Father Marcus had been doing over the years to collect those artifacts. Chapter 10 more fruits from the Church of St. Mark. The enlargement of the facilities provided by building the extension, while modest in proportion, allowed many new services, both spiritual and social, to be created and existing ones to be expanded. As a result, there was an increasing need for additional priests to help carry the services. This need was first met with the ordination of Father Misail Atalla, and then a few years later with the ordination of Father Peshoy Salema. Both were fruits of St. Mark's Church. It is also a source of pride that His Grace General Bishop David of New York, who is the brother of Father Peshoy Salema, and who was ordained on the same day as Father Peshoy by His Holiness Pope Shenouda III, is also a fruit of St. Mark's. With the spiritual guidance of Father Marcos, many more were also ordained as bishops, priests, and monks. A few notable mentions are His Eminence Bishop Tadros, Port Said His Grace Bishop Misail, Birmingham Father Abram Kamel, Richmond Hill Father Epiphanius of Amina, Ireland Father Daniel Risk Halifax, Father Marcos Mansour, Arizona, Father Mikhail Mikhail, Cleveland, Father John Sarkis, Markham, Father Kurillus Fakhuri, St. Mark's, Toronto, Father Mercurius Gorgi, Florida, Father Titus Nicola, Memphis. Chapter 11 The Search for New Land Less than a decade after building its extension, 
St. Mark's Church began to feel inadequate to meet the demand of a growing number of congregants. God always surprised during moments of utter despair. A 12-acre land at the premium location of Warden and Steeles and only one kilometer away from St. Mark's was privately put up for sale. It was the last available piece of land in the general area and, contrary to all expectations, the asking price was within reason. It also helped that the owner was very receptive to selling the land to the church. Truly, this was another miracle. Thank you, Lord. Soon after, arrangements were made to have His Holiness Pope Shenouda III visit Toronto and bless the new land. The conceptual plan for the land was presented to His Holiness Pope Shenouda III, who approved it and later gave it his blessings by laying the cornerstone for the Coptic Canadian village on the new land. This took place on September 7, 2002, during His Holiness's visit to Toronto to celebrate the 25th anniversary of laying the cornerstone for the first Coptic Church of St. Mark in North America. Chapter 12 His Holiness Pope Tawadros II Historic Visit to Toronto Cathedral Inauguration and the 50th Anniversary Celebrations on November 18, 2013, while the Coptic Church in Egypt was celebrating His Holiness Pope Tawadros II's first enthronement anniversary, Father Marcos extended an invitation to His Holiness to visit St. Mark's new cathedral and to consecrate its four altars. His Holiness graciously accepted the invitation and set the time of the visit to Toronto in September 2014 so as to celebrate three major events at the same time. The 50th anniversary of the establishment of the Coptic Church in North America. The 50th anniversary of Father Marcos's ordination for the priesthood. And the consecration of the new St. Mark's Cathedral. It was a gracious gesture from His Holiness showing his pastoral care for his flock as well as sharing with them the wonderful works of God in His Holy Church. His Holiness's visit was truly historic and the celebrations were both solemn and joyous and left a lasting deep impression on the congregation as a whole, young and old. The jokes he used to do and to tell were very unique. And every time we sit with him, we were just expecting him to uh, tell a story which is funny or to tell an incident which was very humorous. And for this, we felt the environment of comfort and the environment of peace. Sabuna, when attending banquet, like banquets for weddings, he would say usually, uh, and then we all start start laughing. And I think no matter how many times he said that, uh, whether before priesthood or after priesthood or during my priesthood, being with him there, uh, we still laugh so much uh, at it. Mm, but I, I learned from it also, like, you know, and hasalli mahma hasalli. Abuna Sam'an Waldi, Rabbina Nayah Nafsu, came to me one time, and I'm going to go to وبعدين قلت له حاجة اقتراح يعني أبونا سمان ما عجبوش الاقتراح ده فراح جي قال لي أنا دلوقتي مش سمعان أي حاجة يعني مش سامع أي حاجة بس يقولها باسمه هو يعني بعدين أنا قلت الحكاية دي لأبونا مرقس فقلت له أنا كنت بكلم والدي أبونا سمعان بقول له ما عجبتوش المو... الم... الموضوع فقال لي أنا مش سمعان قال لي لأبونا سمعان قال لك أنا مش سمعان قول له لا يا شيخ عشان هو اسمه سمعان الشيخ أول عربية آه الكنيسة كانت جابتها الغوث سبونا مرقص آه كان آه يعني في هوا بيجي من الأرضية بتاعتها آه طبعا استغرب ايه الحكاية هوا من الأرضية دي لأن كانت عربية آه مستخدمة وقديمة ومصدية وكانت آه يعني في خروم يعني في الأرضية بتاعتها آه وكانت تجيب هوا من الدية أول عربية لأبونا مرقص وطبعا هو أبونا قبل كل هذه الظروف من أجل 
الخدمه ومن اجل ان الخدمه تستمر اللي احنا دلوقتي بنستمتع بيها وعايشين على حسها. ابونا مرقص هو سيمبلي امبيشس تشيرفل كونفدنت اند موست اوف اول ابونا مرقص از ا فاذر تو اول اوف اس اند تو مي بيرسونلي. فاذر ماركوس واز ا ريال فاذرلي فيجر فاذر ماركوس واز ا ريال ليدر فاذر ماركوس واز ا ليجند ان هيز سبريتشواليتي ان هيز ويزدم اند ان هيز كوبتيك اورثودوكسي Father Marcus simply was very loving, very sensitive, and very wise. Uh, yeah, he, Abuna was uh, like to me, for me, he was very nice to me. He is like irre irreplaceable to all of us, and he was so, I really loved him. Uh, he was very nice, uh, Abuna. One of the nicest one, really, yeah. So. If you want to know what faith is, Yeah. Just look at the picture of Abuna Morgos. If you know what optimist is, just look at Abuna Morgos. If you know, if you want to know what uh, what a struggle is, yeah. just read the history of Abuna Morgos. I feel like a spiritual midget standing beside a spiritual giant. I feel in no way able to speak any words before my dear father and my mentor and my teacher. Father Marcos is a very simple personality, yet He is very strong and he likes to joke and he welcomes the people with his cheerful touch. He maintained his church as the most peaceful church over a period of almost 50 years, I can tell you that he maintained the most peaceful church. And today also, we are celebrating the departure of our beloved Father Marcus. Marcus, if you consider the Apostle Saint Mark is the founder of Christianity in Egypt, we can also consider Father Marcus Marcus is the founder of the Coptic Church in North America and really Father Marcus Marcus is one of the landmarks in the history of the Coptic Church. حيثما يكون كنزك هناك يكون قلبك أيضا. فكنز وتسبونا كنز سم. عشان كده قلبه باستمرار في السماء. قلبه باستمرار في السماء. بيسعى نحو الجعالة العليا. لا يسعى لمجد أرضي ولكنه يسعى فيما هو لامتداد ملكوت الله Dear Father Marx My sincere congratulations for you for your safe arrival to the paradise of joy Enjoy Eternal, joyful life with God. You work hard for it. You deserve it. Please pray for all your spiritual children everywhere. As we've heard here today, Father Marcos dedicated his life to the service of others. The church meant everything to him. 
from the 30 families, the 30 pioneering families who started the church in Toronto, St. Mark's, to all of us here today who are part of the Living Church, we meant everything to him. A special thank you goes to the fathers of St. Mark's, Father Misael, Father Ammonios, Father Beshoy, Father John, Father Mark, Father Bulas, and Father Karelos. My father would be gratified to know that the church is in good hands. Thank you very much. الأساقفة في كندا نيافة الأنبا مينا في غرب كندا ونيافة الأنبا بولس في شرق كندا وعزي الأباء الكهنة في كل كنائس كندا وبالأخص في مدينة تورنتو وعزي الخدام والخادمات والأراخنة في كنائس كندا والذين تمتعوا بالتلمزة على يد هذا الخادم الأمين وتمتعوا بالخدمة معه وسلمهم الكنيسة القبطية بكل تاريخها سلمهم هذا التراث المجيد الذي تعيش فيه الكنيسة في كندا وعزيكم جميعا وعزي أيضا تسوني سوزي وأعرف أنها رفيقة أبونا المنتقل رفيقته في الخدمة وفي التعب وفي البزل وكانت معه من البداية وقد حكى لنا أبونا مرقس حكايات كثيرة على بدايات الخدمة الصعبة وكيف كان التصوني سوزي مساعدة له وبتسنده وانطلقوا سوا في عمل الرب وفي الخدمة الكبيرة أعزي أبنائه الأحباء وأعزي أبنائه الروحيين في كل مكان وأشترك معكم وأنقل إليكم تعزية المجمع المقدس للكنيسة القبطية الأرثوذكسية كل الأباء البطارنة والأباء الأساقفة أيضا الأباء الكهنة في مصر وكل الشعب القبطي المحب للمسيح أعزيكم جميعا وعلى رجاء القيامة نودعه ونصلي أن يكون شفيعا لنا أمام عرش السماء وأيضا يكون مصليا من أجلنا ومن أجل الخدمة في الكنيسة في كل مكان وأن نستعد جميعا لكي ما تكون لنا النهاية الصالحة تعزيات القلبية ربنا يكون وياكم وأشكركم كثيرا The repose of Father Marcos, his legacy of our beloved Father Marcos was a sad event indeed. This great loss was felt not only by the community of St. Mark, but also by Coptic communities near and far in North America, many of whom he had founded and nursed in his early service across the continent. However, we should have a sense of peace and solace in the fact that Father Marcos lived to see his dream of establishing a magnificent cathedral for St. Mark come true. This cathedral is now served by honorable priests, a chorus of dedicated deacons, many faithful servants, and a grateful and growing congregation. Father Marcos also left a great vision for expansion and development to serve the community of St. Mark and others for many generations to come. More importantly, however, is the legacy and example he left for us through the principles and values he lived by over the course of his 50 plus years of service. These include, among many others, his role as a peacemaker, which our Lord commended. As well, his generosity to everyone who sought him, whether through his time, resources, 
or simple acts of love that touched the lives of everyone he met. Father Marcos was also known for his warm exchanges. His radiant smile was enough to light a room and to lift the spirits of anyone who saw him. He always emphasized that the church is not a corporation ruled by taking votes, but it is the body of Christ. All decisions, therefore, must reflect the one mind of Christ, which we can achieve by listening and obeying to the voice of the Holy Spirit within us. Quiet introspection about the life of Father Marcos makes us rejoice in the fact that such a remarkable man lived and served among us. And as a servant who is faithful to his Lord, who wisely invested the talents he had received from him, Father Marcos therefore deserves to hear our Lord's sweet voice saying to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Amen.